Trek. This is this is Sarah. <laughs> I feel like I'm answering the phone. Hello, Fiber Trek. This is Sarah. How can I help you? Um, well, my name is Sarah. It's May 20th. This is episode eight. I'm so glad you decided to join me. Whether you're a returning viewer or this is the first time you've been able to tune in, thank you so much for your time. I know that we have um, had a little bit of a funny schedule, but I um, I'm hoping to get this out uh, ASAP. With that being said, I wanted to just give you a little insight into our agenda today. I do have a, a little bit of down the pike for you, which you might find interesting. I have fiber track, I have works in progress, finished objects, acquisitions and discoveries, uh, a new segment I'm calling textiles and time, and of course a fond farewell. So. Um, we're going to start with introductions. I heard from a friend on the board. She decided to introduce herself. Um, that's C.S. Tom K. And uh, described her ultimate fiber trek to Scotland, which perfect choice. It's a great way to get out and see some new countryside and experience something completely different than what we're used to in the United States. And uh, and it's not that far to travel to, and it's a it's a completely doable trip. I also heard from Anne Fran, whose ultimate fiber trek was to Ireland and Scotland. So, very common. And, 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 you know, they hold a lot. They have a huge wool culture. So, there's a lot to do and there's a lot to see. And it's just nice that, at least for me, uh, I think London is a five hour flight. And then, um, but I can be in Glasgow. I, I've flown Icelandic Air before through Reykjavik and then into Glasgow. And that, with a layover, takes a little bit longer. but but easily doable. And then I heard from One in It Socks, and she described her first knitting project and how her love affair for rustic wool began. Of course, she had me at rustic wool. And her first knitting project was an Icelandic lopi sweater. And this gave me an opportunity to reflect on what my first knitting project was, which this is not going to be any surprise to those of you who have watched or know me personally. And it will also tie a little bit into my textiles and time segments. It's all going to come together. And I decided to knit this complete Viking vest. It's, it was like seed stitch arms and a cable braid. It was like very boxy, like a tunic. I knit it with Reynolds yarn, 100% wool yarn, and a deep dark natural brown. Nobody's surprised. Nobody is surprised. So I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to kind of bring that memory out. And if you want to share what your first knitting project was and how you kind of got there, feel free to do so in the episode thread. I am still running the contest in the re-entry thread, which I'm going to add a tagline to that title, which is um, Textiles and Time. So that will be open another week for the the stitch marker drawing. So if you'd like to enter that, please feel free to go on, go on over and in that thread, let us know where you would like to go back in time and when. And what you'd like to see there for a fiber event. And we've had some interesting entries, which was kind of the impetus for my new segment. And we'll talk a little bit about how I got there when we get there. How I got there when we got there, when we get there. Um, so for Down the Pike this week, I thought some of you wildlife enthusiasts would appreciate this story, which I really wish my husband was here to tell you. Um, I went uh, dancing with Morgan on Saturday night, which I never ever do. The whole four years I've lived here, I've never driven south to, to Bangor or anywhere, pretty much, in the evenings on a, to do anything, to go out to dinner, nothing, to go see a movie, nothing. Because there's such a possibility of hitting a moose on the way home, and it's such a huge stretch of desolate road. So anyway, I was like, we're doing it. So I put on my dancing shoes and we went down and we danced till about 1130 to this like 90s rock band, cover band. There was dry ice. It was very exciting. So <clears throat> I called Rob and he's like, you're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe it. I was like, no, I'm not going to believe it. Tell me. So at about 830 that night, I'm off gallivanting and rowdy, you know, rowdy rousing, um, with my cowboy boots. <clears throat> we had a sow with two cubs show up at our house and just ransack the feeders. And 
Rob was able to scare them a little bit, bit away, and he was able to get some of the feeders in, but not all of them. Excuse me. <clears throat> well, they stayed for three hours. Like, they wouldn't go away, no matter what he did. <clears throat> and he knew he had to get the dogs out. So he, like, peeks out the door. She's, like, laying in the driveway with the cubs, just laying there, like, hey. We're hanging out. Put the feeders back out. We would really appreciate that. So he has to call his buddy, Isaac, who comes over. And they treed the bears. They ran up this big pine in our front yard. And Isaac shone the flashlight on them while Rob got the, all the dogs out to go to the bathroom and brought them back in. And he was like, they must be gone by now. Like after that, all that ruckus and the dogs, because bears don't typically like dogs. That's how they, um, well, I won't get into that. I'll let Morgan get into that with her new segment, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, so I think he popped out to see, to pick up another feeder and they're sitting on the porch and he, sh and when you shine the light at them, their eyes reflect a green glow. So they were just relentless and it's really rare. Typically the bears we've had here, we've been able to go out and, you know, Hey, Hey, and they run off and that's that. So we've set up the trail cam to see if we can catch any more action. But we bring the feeders in every night, of course, because we don't want them to get acclimated to getting food. When they come out of hibernation this time of year, they're very hungry. They tend to eat grass. And, uh, and so any, anything is, of course, appealing. And what isn't more appealing than suet and black sunflower seeds? So they were, they were I found the mother low. They were psyched. Um, I haven't seen them since. They haven't been back. They may be terrorizing my neighbors. But um, I, I have no doubt that they will come back, though. So, so that was our big excitement. Um, Morgan is planning to add a segment to the podcast called the Megafauna, Megafauna Minute with Morgan. And she was going she was going to join me, but she wasn't able to pull together all the information she wanted for her segment. We had touched a little bit on coyotes in our last um, Fibercast. And... So we wanted to put something together to kind of explain some of the strong feeling that we both had about the politics of coyotes in this state. So she's going to do that, and we can pull something together for you about bears if you're interested. So that was our, I mean, I went dancing, there was bears, lots of down the pike for you. Uh, and I'm going to go right into works in progress and finished objects. I know my transitions are a little rugged, but just bear with me. Um, you can kind of see what I'm wearing. I'm going to use my Fancy Dancy remote, and I'm going to go like this. And I'm going to go like this, and hopefully stay in the light. And you can see that I'm wearing Shield Maiden. And this is by Emily Estrada of the Fiber Town Podcast. I come back in now. This is very cool, isn't it? Um, and I knit this for the Island Wool Knit Along, which is still ongoing till the end of June. The only thing you have to do is do something with Island Wool. I think um, Stashless, uh, her name eludes me at the moment, is going to weave. She just got a loom. You should check that episode out because it's quite cute. She just got a loom and she has some wool from New Zealand. And I was like, and she's having um, issues knitting. Uh, and so I said, go ahead and weave something. So she's going to weave something for that. So here it is. It looks awesome. I love it. I'm always peeking around things. Um, you can see the penannular brooch. I'm going to peek again. Right there. And that, um, the name of this project on my Ravelry page is Penannular Perfection. I love the way this fits. <clears throat> I think it came out a little bit smaller than the actual anticipated gauge <clears throat> because I'm just a tight knitter and I didn't go up a needle size because the yarn was, I think, more of a sport weight than a DK. But I love the way it fits. I love that it just sits right on my shoulders. I can wear it when I'm cooking. I can wear it when I'm walking. It doesn't fall around. I don't have to keep rewrapping it. And it really showcases the beauty of that cable and the shape of the shawl. So a really wearable, practical, protective piece. And I don't want to you know, use the words practical and protective in replacement of beautiful and classic. <clears throat> but because this garment captures those adjectives as well. But I think for me, with the name Shield Maiden and some of the overtones of that concept, that is what this 
this shawl embodies for me. I think this is going to be like a safety blanket. You know, I'm going in for the, you know, whatever, you're going to the dentist, you're having a bad day. Um, this is something that you would, you could put on and, and, um, and channel a little archaic energy, um, positive energy, of course, protective energy. So, and on the back is the Lucette pattern with the eyelets. So, um, so I love it. Absolutely love it. I think I would knit another one and I think I would probably choose, I love the way Emily's came out. She did a hand spun Shetland. I love it. So I think I would actually bump up the weight of the yarn that I used and get something a little bit bigger and a little bit more dramatic. Finished object. Thank you very much. Other works in progress. Uh, you know what I'm going to say. Those of you have been watching. I didn't bring it out. But I'm so close. The Burnham Wood Capelet that I'm knitting with the Stansboro Gray Yarn <clears throat> is like 11 rows from being done. So, oh, I say that. I think there's an I-cord bind off. And I have to figure that out. I've done it before. But, but I'm 11 rows from being finished with the knitting. And then it's just going to be a matter of blocking that beast because it is a beast of a garment. Uh, but I'm excited. And then I have the Rota Brioche Cowl, which I haven't done anything on, but it still lurks next to my knitting chair and stares at me with its beautiful colors. My husband has been knitting away. He is a fiend. And he picked up some Jacob and Lincoln fiber um, from the Ross Farm Fibers booth at Maryland Sheep and Wool. And he has been knitting his sock. And here it is. He's done with the leg and he is ready to turn the heel. Um, it's a gorgeous chocolate brown and yeah he's done all this. So he has both legs done for the um, for, for the socks and he unfortunately goes in for surgery on Thursday which will preclude him from knitting. So these will be waiting for him when he's ready to take that back up and gets the okay from the doctor. And that is in his very special, I always love to point this out, you may have seen this before, this is his very special, this is his knitting project bag. He's like, I got that at a search and rescue conference. I don't know what to do with it, but now I do. I'm like, perfect. Um, I've really been inspired with my knitting. I mean, my spinning. See what I mean? I gotta get my spinning mojo back, and I'm trying. I was finally able to order some extra bobbins and Oops, excuse me for just a minute, I have to reach. Um, and what I mean by that is I have these plastic bobbins that are made by Leclerc for, for weaving shuttles. And they're little, and I ordered five more of these, but I ordered the six inch, these are four. <clears throat> this is uh, BFL Spunky Eclectic. The name of the colorway is River Rock, River Walk. And I'm spinning this as a fingering two-ply. I don't know if those colors are going to come up. But it's kind of teals and browns and greenies. And um, so I have, I cleaned off, I want to clean off this bobbin. Because so I have four bobbins for my Lendrum wheel. So I have this bobbin as well. Excuse me. So I ordered the six inch holders so I could clean this off and clean off another one, and um, and then on my orders from the net loft, I've been getting these great plastic bags, and what I've done is I've gone ahead and put the yarn in them, and then I have a sticky note which describes what's in it, how much yarn is on each bobbin, um, etc. So these singles will become a two-ply, and then I also have my Shetland Coriadale fleece, and you can see I've been preparing bobbins. I have a bobbin on the Lendrum right now, this is my first bobbin, and I'm just going to spin three bobbins and then wind them off onto the holders um, and see what happens. So, <clears throat> so these are really handy because I can see right through them and I know what's exactly in them. And with that, I spun up a half an ounce of combed fiber that I prepared on Saturday, and then I combed another half an ounce of the Corydale Shetland, and here's my Ness. I figured it takes me 45 minutes to comb 
<clears throat> a quarter ounce or half an ounce. I can't remember if it's a quarter. Each of these is about an eighth of an ounce, and I can spin, I can comb four of them in 45 minutes. So that's a half an ounce in 45 minutes. So, yeah, they smell so good. They're a little bit lanolin left. Lanolin, there's a little bit of lanolin left. That's a lot of L's. A little bit of lanolin left. That's a lot of L's. Yikes. Anyway, so I have that. I combed that up this weekend. I'm going to spin that maybe tonight when I'm done recording. I figure if I can just keep on the combing, keep up with the spinning, because that fleece is just going. Um, and you'll know why I got some of my spinning mojo back at Acquisitions and Discoveries. So, with that being said, let's go right to Acquisitions and Discoveries. <clears throat> uh, back uh, for my birthday, I had ordered some yarn from Snow Capped Yarns from the Net Loft, and she dyed up, as part of that order, a sweater's worth of the Latouche in her blowing 40 colorway. That's coming up way blue. It's much lighter than that. It's like a gray, a gray blue. Mm, might be there. And I'm going to do the Lila sweater by Carrie Bostic Hogue out of this. That was generously gifted to me on my birthday from a friend. And yeah, so I'm psyched about that. That came, I don't know, this yarn is magic for me. And I don't know what it is. I find myself attracted to all colorways, um, all the bases. And I feel like it's just magic. I don't know. I've just associated with this yarn. I don't know if it's that it's called Old Salt and there's like seafaring overtones and kind of historic overtones or what. Or it's a romanticism of Alaska, but it's captivated me and I am, I am a proponent. I own a lot of it. And I love it because it gets me out of my box. It makes me buy color. It offers a wide range, as I said before, of non-superwash options for people like myself, but she also has superwash options for people who have who want to have choice. So, <clears throat> so I love it. And then, I know, I don't think anything makes me happier than stashing fiber. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in textiles in time. I had an Etsy gift card that I've been looking to use, and I knew that uh, Mary Ann of Three Waters Farm was going to have a colorway. She didn't have it at Maryland Sheep and Wool. She sold out, and she was going to restock it in the shop, and I wanted to get it. And you're going to be very proud of me. This is Olive Green Tonal by Three Waters Farm. That's showing up a little bit green. It's a little bit more muted than that, uh, which makes it perfect for me, right? Um, but it's got some gorgeous blues in it, and in <clears throat> this kind of like sea green, and into these beautiful olives. So now you understand why I've been pushing getting my bobbins cleaned off, because I want to be able to spin lots of different types of fiber, and not just be spinning that charcoal gray Shetland Coriadale, which I love, but wouldn't it be fun to spin this? I also have the turquoise, I don't know if you remember, but... I, I got a skein of her BFL turquoise. So that's acquisitions and discoveries. That's whips and, pro whips and finished objects. So I'm going to go right into textiles and time. And I decided that preparing a little segment on some of the interests the group had expressed in our um, question uh, which was, where would you go back in time and when, and what would, would you want to see? I thought I would try to pull together some uh, mini lessons about <clears throat> those particular topics. I decided to go with um, the Norse culture to start because of Shield Maiden, and it was a culture I was familiar with. I used to teach World Civ, and there was a red, you know, red, I had resources readily available to me. But there were some interesting topics that were brought up. They brought up um, <clears throat> Jacob in the Old Testament. <clears throat> so sorry. Which is a great uh, topic, an interesting topic to think about. They brought up Portuguese history, um, Cajun history. So I thought, well, maybe I could pull together some 
some information and create some context around what we do historically and give some insight into perhaps why we do it. And I think with this particular topic, uh, I was inspired, I may have said this, I was inspired by Shield Maiden. Um, Shield Maiden has some um, Norse mythological overtones and cultural overtones, as well as the island will knit along. Um, of course, I'm working with North Ronaldsey yarn, and those sheep are pretty close descendants of what the Vikings were probably hanging around with. <clears throat> so when we talk about that particular time in history, we're looking at the 8th to 11th century. Um, that's basically the 700s to the, um, the aughts, like 1066, right before the Battle of um, Hastings. And a lot of scholars kind of uh, mark the beginning of this uh, Norse culture exploitation with the 700s because that was the one of the first attacks, one of the major attacks on Linda's Farm Monastery. Some of you may be familiar with the Linda's Farm Gospels, which of course were saved. And so this exploitation and this kind of dispersal and colonization of this culture out of Norway, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and down into the areas um, of present-day England and into northern France, which would be Brittany, uh, really began. And of course, we're familiar with the word Viking, um, and we use it as a descriptor, but really it's a verb. And it was a verb <clears throat> to describe trading missions and exploitation of resources. And that typically happened in the summer. Um, that's when the seafaring culture obviously was able to navigate the surrounding area much easier. Some of the most intense currents and tides of the world exist where the Atlantic and the North Sea come together, and particularly Orkney. Um, so the prowess with which one had to maneuver around that area um, was highly intense and probably didn't need to be uh, challenged with the winter, which could, the, gale, the gales up there, of course, you know, would be problematic uh, when traveling in the types of ships they traveled in, which is they had no cover. They had um, the long ships, which were typically associated with the exploits, were very narrow. Um, they were powered by oars and sails. Um, and the cargo ships were a little bit wider, but they didn't have, they did not have cover. It wasn't like you could go below deck. So <clears throat> really needed to pick your season well. So Viking was a verb, and it was a, it kind of meant pirate, pirating. <clears throat> um, some of us are familiar with the concept of berserkers, and these were men who amped themselves up either through um, narcotics <clears throat> or just general hype. I think a lot of it came through narcotics, which allowed them to be so brutal. And that's, of course, what they're known for, with these brutal attacks <clears throat> and pillaging. But in effect, a number of their um, trading missions were that. They were trading. They traveled down to Baghdad along rivers. They traveled over overland quite well. <clears throat> they were able to move their boats overland using... Um, a series of logs, um, so they portaged. <clears throat> they traveled extensively to Russia, and in fact, the word Russia is a derivative root of a Swedish word, Rus, which means Viking. So extensive travelers, and probably the first Europeans to come to the Americas. There is a, Newf there is a Viking Norse settlement in Newfoundland called Lanzo Meadows, and there is even some talk of them getting all the way to Minnesota on the river systems. So extensive travelers. We know that they were in Greenland, Iceland, and Faroe, and we know that they were settled there with actual settlements. Those weren't just port calls They actually had people living there, farming there. And you may know more history than that. I didn't want to get too much into the Leif Erikson and the whole nine yards, but um, but really just an extensive culture with, with far-reaching aspirations. They had a very strong textile culture. Many of us are familiar with, um, even if you've just heard the term Viking combs, that is because, in fact, they are a Viking or Norse tool. 
Predominantly, the Norse <clears throat> were combers and worsted preparations for spinning. Their sheep would have, as I said, resembled the Shetlands and the Icelandic. Their most, the closest, and I can't pronounce this because it has a funny uh, vowel um, component, is the Shepsla, uh, or Shepslu, which is a Swedish sheep, which would probably be the closest relative. They were, rel they were smaller sheep, which the most primitive breeds are. And <clears throat> they predominantly used the wool for clothing, duh, um, but they also used it to create sails. This is something that's very fascinating for me. To think, and I think Columbus um, also used wool sails, but getting around and using wool sails, I mean, imagine lifting those when they're wet with salt water and the gale is beating against your boat and it's icy and you're, you have no cover. Um, they, the sails, because of that weight, were crisscrossed with leather to give them some structure. And um, they were also used, they could take those sails off and create tents because again they had no shelter aboard. So just something interesting to think about. You, know, you think about wool for clothing and blankets but for sales is a completely different aspect to the resource than what I'd be immediately familiar with. You know like oh <clears throat> right. Um, they had flax and they prepared flax in the traditional way. They redded it, they rotted out the seed pods and then they beat it <clears throat> and spun it. Um, but they definitely were wool people. Wool had the insulatory components that they needed for a living in a, you know, a pretty severe climate and, um, and the sheep were a multi-resourceful animal. Milk, meat, and wool. So <clears throat> They were predominantly weavers and they had a form of knotting this yarn called knot binding, which they used to make socks, caps, and mittens. But most of the clothing would have been woven. Preparation, and this is what, you know, for me as a historian, and which is probably why I'm more of a cultural historian, <clears throat> I'm just so, what's the word? Hmm. I don't know. I love that when I comb on my combs, I'm participating in an event that happened 1300 years ago and it is no different. It's no different. It's probably almost even the same materials, um, wood and iron. And now granted my fleece that I wash, I use, uh, I use a wool wash. <clears throat> Sometimes I just do a hot soak and I leave the lanolin in it. Um, there may have been preparations. The, the yarn <clears throat> or the wool has a substance called swint which is a natural cleanser. And I picked up this little tidbit from Judith McEwen. You can leave these fleeces packed in water for long periods of time and they'll self-clean. If you can stand the stench, uh, you can go over and lift them out and they'll, they'll be clean. And then the lanolin will be left and then you can progress from there. So <clears throat> my, the shearing, the washing, um, the combing, all very similar. And then even down to the spinning. Norse cultures had both top and bottom whorl spindles, and those spindles were found all the way into Newfoundland. And one of the, the, the interesting parts of that is when we can trace the female presence through the tool, and we know that there were actually colonies in Newfoundland because of the presence of spindles, and that women were there. <clears throat> These weren't just you know expeditions that had gone awry, or you know, people had set out and brought their tools with them. Women <clears throat> in this culture were afforded quite a bit of liberty. The men left all summer, and summer is an important time on the farm. In fact, it's probably the most important time. And you're bringing in harvest, you're dealing with fattening animals, you're shearing, you're getting all that prepared for winter. So because of that responsibility, they maintained a lot of clout. They were able to divorce, they were able to maintain property, they were able to take half of that property if they were to leave the marriage, and they were also uh, able to marry for love. There were no arranged marriages. So a lot of empowerment <clears throat> within those tools. <clears throat> they were responsible for one of the most cherished possessions of the culture, which was clothing. They made it. They did everything. And, you know, you wield... Um, you wield power when you wield necessity. So 
their participation in this process from start to finish um, did not go unnoticed by the culture. The particular um, area where I gathered some information was an article by, let me grab her name, it's right here. Da, 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 da. Nina, I think it's Nina Lilhall. Um, and she wrote about a settlement in Sweden called Burka, which was about uh, 600 people. And they found over, let me get my notes correct, 429 spindles and whorls were found in this particular settlement. And they ranged in, their world types were stone and ceramics and beads and amber, metal. And they, they postulate that there was even wood. <clears throat> but of course that material is susceptible to decay. Um, they had varied shapes and varied weights. They weighed um, from 5 grams up to 130 grams. So we know that they were capable of producing different weights of yarn. And um, that of course would dictate the type of fabric they were able to create. Um, and, uh, and we also know that... Uh, there were varied shapes. It wasn't just one shape was associated with one area. So they had conical shapes, they had flat whorls, they had conical whorls, flat whorls, um, flat convex, so a variety of um, whorls, and their shafts were predominantly um, bone or wood. So just something really interesting to kind of um, to look at. I think what I was most interested in is that there was varying weights. It wasn't just, it wasn't primitive. Um, there was care and thought. There was a correlation and an understanding of that physics that's involved with the weight of the whorl and the weight of your yarn or, you know, the quality of your yarn. <clears throat> um, three kilograms of wool would probably equal one garment and the spinning time for that was a hundred days. So I'm just wanting to give you a little bit of an idea of the investment of time at that point. And um, that included preparing, that included the processing of combing and washing. Uh, they wove on vertical looms. They were um, long looms, and then they leaned up against a wall. They could weave up to a 65-inch wide piece of fabric. And it took them one day to produce a half a square yard of fabric, which would have been 20-inch, 20-inch, um, something of 40 inch wide fabric. I don't know what that notation is, but I know it's a half a square yard per day. Um, clothing was very important. Uh, typically people had one set of clothes. <clears throat> it was a symbol of wealth if you had more and a symbol of generosity and hospitality if you could share that clothing with strangers or people in need. So <clears throat> it was a necessity and I like to correlate that to my own stash. <laughs> I know it's like justify it. Uh, you know, I'm participating in, in a necessity. I'm creating something that I need. I need shelter, I need clothing, and I need food. And I do that. So, um, I know, that's, that's just really, you know, scraping the bottom of the barrel there, isn't it? But, uh, but I, you know, I can understand, um, I can understand, I know we always get up into clothing about expression, <clears throat> um, creative expression because they did do quite intricate embroidery on this on types of clothing but the concept of clothing as generosity or you know just what is encapsulated in all that work and the value the culture has for that um, particular element of survival is it's just interesting to me I don't know I think I've said the word interesting a lot so if you're playing a drinking game <clears throat> and that's the word you picked. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I say it a lot in the other ones, too. Um, let's see. Socks were a sign of wealth. Not everybody had socks because, you know, they probably were time-consuming and they used other materials. They used moss and hay and other cushiony, insulatory materials to stuff their boots with. And um, so socks were a real um, sign of capable, you know, help and time and skill. 
the weaves they were able to do, they were able to do plain and twill. So plain weave is literally under, over, under, over, under, over, over, under, over, under, over, under. And then that, those two, um, those two rows are repeated with your, with your shuttle. So you go back and forth and then switch and then back and forth and then switch. Um, the threads go, you know, back up. And then you can vary that based on how you, which threads you move up and down and which interval. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm not a weaver, so interpreting that to the layperson may not have been the most clear. But basically, they were capable of doing lots of different types of designs, both plain and twills. And you can think about <clears throat> what types of fabrics they were able to create. So, um, so that's just some interesting facts about the Norse culture and just creating a little context for where we're coming from with um, some of the island wools that we're working with and even some of the patterns that have been inspired um, to members of the group. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping next week on Textiles and Time, I'm going to try to look at the story and history of Jacob and his sheep and see what I can come up with um, for some um, information. Uh, yeah, speaking of the Island Wool Knit Along, that was Textiles and Time, done. And speaking of Island Wool Knit Along, it's not a very smooth segue, but it's getting late, and so I figure I better um, move forward. Uh, <clears throat> that's still ongoing, I think I said this at the end of June, as is the giveaway for the Blue Dog Woolly Stitch Marker, so please go tell me all about what you'd like to do. And Fiber Trek. We're going to release our episode with Mary Jane Mucklestone and Janny of Starcroft Fiber Mail, Janny Estelle. That will release at the end of May. I have a shoot set up in two weeks with Nanny Kennedy of Meadowcroft Farm, and we'll be going there to learn about lambing. And she also has a solar dyeing operation that she uses seawater for. So we'll be looking at a number of different elements on the farm. I think that's it. I think I'm going to do a fond farewell. I think you can hear my dog snoring. Um, you can find me on Instagram as Fibertrek TV, on Ravelry as Swinsty, and you'll see that in the credits. You can also find me on Facebook, on the blog, and you can also email me at fibertrek at gmail.com. We have a new website you can check out, which is fibertrektv.com, and the blog is now housed there as well. And I think that's it. I hope you all have a great day. And